Hello everybody, this is Manu S and welcome back to another Legends of Runeterra metagame breakdown. This will be the very first metagame breakdown with the new set since release. Um, a little bit of a change here since we don't have a lot of masters yet. The data provided by Mobilitics this time is from all ranks. So this is the total amount of games played um, since release. It only includes games from release till last Sunday. So not quite uh, a full week, but um, yeah, we, we got, uh, other than that, we're going to do the usual. We're going to look at the top five most played decks um, to get give you an idea what the meta game is looking like right now. It's still a lot uh, of flux, but it gives you a general idea of where things are headed. And then we take a look at the top five highest win rate decks um, to see what is doing well so far. All right, um, you know the drill. Hit the subscribe button down below if you haven't yet to not miss out on future content. And before we dive right into the decks that I have uh, prepared for you, um, I want to briefly introduce you to today's sponsor. So I'll see you in a moment. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN, one of the leading virtual private network providers out there. A virtual private network keeps your data secure and yourself anonymous while using the internet. NordVPN comes with super fast servers, allows you to unlock your favorite entertainment websites like Netflix. They provide a 30 day money back guarantee. They also have an included cybersecurity suit, which acts as an ad blocker to boot. They don't lock any of your data, provide a 24 seven customer support, and you can use it on up to six simultaneous connections. So one account covers most or all of your electronic devices. And most importantly, they don't have any bandwidth limit, so you can use it nonstop without it getting throttled, which is particularly important for heavy users like us. It also won multiple awards and comes highly recommended by top technology experts. So if you're still surfing online without a VPN, now is the time to change that. Get NordVPN now, 70% off for a three year plan, including one month extra for free using the code MANUS or the personalized link in the description down below. And now on to today's content. All right, so we are back. Time to look at the decks. So as usual, we're going to look at the five most played decks first from least played to most played in that order. So first off, Ezreal Karma, old favorite, is still going strong. It's still pretty popular. It also got a couple of nice tools. So it uh, comes in in fifth place in terms of most popular archetypes. Um, in terms of new cards, we see Eye of the Dragon has replaced Kempunk, which makes sense. Eye of the Dragon is a really, really powerful card that also effectively only costs one power uh, due to having a tune, which is amazing. And it provides a source of lifesteal. It also provides a source of potential pressure against reactive opponents. Um, it has a decently durable body at 1-3, just a really good card. And then the other new tools we're seeing is Deep Meditation, a really good card draw spell. Um, basically, um, kind of like Glimpse in that if you play two spells last turn, it only costs two and then it draws two spells. And drawing two spells is as good or sometimes better than drawing two cards for a deck like this because you need your spells to control the board and help level up your Ezreal and Deep Meditation is great at that. The other new card is Concussive Palm. Um, it's basically like... Um, Arachnoid Sentry except that it costs one more and is a fast spell. The main downside uh, here basically is that it can be countered by something like Deny or Fizzled by certain effects. And um, the other thing is, um, if the opponent doesn't have a unit, you can't play it, unlike Sentry. Um, so in some cases that can be awkward. And the other thing is, while well, the fast effect provides an upside of responding to open attacks and stuff like that, it also means that in certain situations you might be able to concussive palm, but since the unit only happens after it resolves, that the unit might not be able to participate in combat in situations where it otherwise could. But that is a minor downside. So yeah, all in all, Ezreal Karma, still uh, very popular, um, with some good updates here. Um, makes sense that people look at old decks to update them and play tried and true stuff. Um, to be fair, I tried the deck and I haven't been super impressed with it. It feels kind of like a bit slow and clunky against a lot of the like more powerful proactive strategies that uh, we are seeing right now, stuff like burn and so on. 
So I'm not sure if it's going to be as strong of a deck as it used to, but it's certainly at least a very decent choice, I think. If we look at the stats, though, in terms of win rate, to give you an idea, like in comparison, it is doing okay at like more than 57% uh, win rate, but relative to how the win rate of other decks looks, um, that's actually not um, yeah, that high of a win rate in comparison, but it's pretty solid. Like You have to keep in mind that now that we're looking at um, all the data, um, I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing much higher peak win percentages like the high win percent the high win percentages of like the um, best performing decks this week are above 65 percent which i think is something that you rarely see in masters um anything like past 60 is not that likely to happen we've seen that a couple times like in the low 60s for some decks but all in all at the highest level where everyone is playing tighter and better and playing better decks um the overall win rates all go down a bunch because you get closer to the real win rates if nobody is making as many mistakes anymore and uh, playing very competitive decks um, as opposed to here where there is much more skill discrepancy and uh, there's a much higher chance that after a reset like much better players play against notably weaker players to an extent and creating these much higher um, like win percentage peaks so to speak so keep that in mind um, we will see that adjust i think once we have masters only data again all right on to the next deck next we have draven jinx burn so burn in general um all i can tell you guys is please don't play this list like this list is just not very good like don't put draven and jinx in your burn decks like they are beat down units they are slow they are good units to put in play and fight but this deck doesn't want to fight for board you just want to get your one drops out hit your opponent a little bit and then burn them out because you have so many direct damage tools now that you really don't need it like this deck is shaving so many of the like super good cards like used cask placement is insane in burn it buys you so much time while also dealing damage it's obnoxious only running seven one drops in your burn deck also unforgivable um then only two fervor only two get excited only two decimate three of your best burn spells um is equally like baffling um this deck basically doesn't know what it wants to be it doesn't know whether it wants to be like a beat down echo deck or a burn deck and ends up being not that great at either um i recently released my complete guide on burn uh, as a deck tech going over my uh, deck list explaining why I think all these cards um, like Jinx and Draven are not good in the deck and shouldn't be in the deck and so on and so forth. So if you haven't watched that yet, make sure to check it out. I'll uh, try and remember to link it up here um, so you can check it out because, yeah, these lists that people are running are just, yeah, uh, frustrating to me. So um, make sure to check out the guide and get my full opinion on burn and how it should be built and why um it's pretty comprehensive but yeah um i think burn actually got a got really great tools between imperialist and fervor giving it the critical mass of burn that it needs also allowing you to profitably run disciple i'd never liked disciple before in the deck because it just wasn't good enough and reliable enough and too many two drops but now between transfusion and uh, demolitionist uh, disciple basically turns into a unit slash burn spell so it's almost always a burn spell and also has the potential to just block an attack and deal additional damage there for free um but at least usually does it's like two two or more damage uh, from its triggers which is really really good and noxion fervor is amazing it's basically a better get excited most of the time that also allows you to deny opponents lifesteal stuff like um grasp or um vile feast life gain and stuff like that so it's just sometimes just randomly dealing six damage to the opponent by like countering a grasp and dealing three to them which is insane um card is amazing and should absolutely be run as a three of um but yeah um burn very popular not too surprising got good new tools was fairly popular before especially in early stages of meta games when things um were still shaking out i think this time uh the deck is here to stay and i think it has all the hallmarks of potentially being 
uh, one of the top decks of the tier one decks because um, they pushed it quite a bunch with the two no cards that it got and also makes the deck able to streamline very much and lean heavily into its burn plan of just interacting as little as possible and just kind of like running down the opponent's clock and the opponent is basically playing against the ticking time bomb from the start um yeah let's burn on to number three number three is elusive aggro um please don't call this elusive otk this deck doesn't try to set up a one turn kill and kill in one turn it very rarely might end up playing out like that but not really and not usually because um, you usually kill over like two or three turns in multiple attacks um, I really dislike when all these terms get watered down and end up not meaning anything anymore um, these terms mean specific things and it's important that they are used to mean these specific things because that is what allows us to talk about these things and an OTK deck is a one turn kill deck it's a deck it's a kind of combo deck that tries to set up a one turn kill and this is not that deck this is just kind of like an evasive um sort of tempo deck that just tries to um cheese out the opponent in a couple of quick attacks ideally um with evasive units or Z or sometimes randomly goes the like Fiora um, win condition route if that uh, lines up well. But yeah, this is just like kind of a all in sort of deck standalone standalone thing. I have played similar lists in the past. I'm not the biggest fan of this particular route because I don't really like Greenclay Duo or Blade Scout very much, but um, they they make some sense i guess because for example blade scout with a relentless pursuit turn is like four extra damage so it helps you sort of close out games faster but i think you can also kind of accomplish that by just running a couple of more a couple more tricks that kind of do the same but also have the potential to um yeah um protect your units so not sure how much i like this but all in all this is pretty straightforward um so if you want to just get some quick games in, cheese out opponents, this is a solid choice. It's pretty popular because uh, Swim has been championing it and it just, some decks just can't win against it um, while others might take you apart. Uh, my problem with these kinds of decks usually has been that they are a bit kind of like inconsistent and um, one trick ponies in that sure certain decks just kind of never really have a chance when facing you but against other stuff they just kind of um yeah take your stuff apart and then you have no real chance of winning as much as some other opponents don't have much of a chance beating you um but yeah i mean um i can see the deck potentially doing fine depending on what the meta game looks like um i have had quite some success and fun with my version that I played in the uh, AFK um, Creators Invitational back then, but only did okay with it in the tournament. And it's leaning a bit more into the tempo, controlling the pace of the game kind of route, rather than playing these like marginal uh, cards like Blade Scout and stuff like that. And also plays like um, No Fiora, a bit more Elusives and Blade Scout to lean into the uninteractive part more because Fiora is kind of uh, weird in that regard. Oh yeah, this is the third most uh, popular deck. Uh, if we look at the win rate, um, it's doing pretty well. Like it has 62% win rate right now over the 3,100 games, which I'm not too surprised, especially at lower ranks because a lot of people are not very um, prepared for this kind of deck and don't know how to tackle it best and then feel kind of like, this is unfair and broken and just lose to it while well, i think at a higher level the win rate of a deck like this uh, would go down notably but yeah um if you want to play something that doesn't require any new cards there you go zero zero rising tides cards all right next we have um number two lee sin twisted fate spell sort of tempo deck um I think the most popular version of this, while this is not the version on screen, one of the more prominent people that has been playing this deck is T-Red, the creator of the old um, 
Ephemeral, Deathmark, Hecarim, Z deck, uh, which was a really cool deck and really well designed. Um, which I can't say um, about this archetype. I think this deck is really cool, but also really, really bad. I tried it a bunch, and it's just it's so clunky and so slow and anything that is like a top tier deck will just roll over uh, roll all over you and it's not even funny and the win rate kind of reflects that this deck has a win rate below 45% uh, um, over like more than 3000 games the deck I th I'm afraid is very likely just not good even though it's really cool and really appealing which is why I gave it a try as well but yeah it's not not legit it's just too fragile and too clunky and gimmicky i think which is a bit unfortunate because it's a really cool concept but yeah can't recommend this um this deck has a worse has a notably worse win rate than both starter decks because that's the thing since this is all ranks it, the starter decks show up as well like the the spider starter deck has a win rate of almost 57 percent <clears throat> and the uh, Jinx Z starter deck has a win rate of 51%. So um, that tells you a lot if starter decks have like five to like five, uh, more than five to 10% higher win rate than this deck, how bad this deck is. So yeah, can't recommend it unless you really don't care about winning and just really like how cool this deck is. And last but not least, in first place, we have deep sea exploration as i like to call it basically it's nautilus deep sea uh, deep and sea monsters um as you can see this deck is super popular because it plays mostly new cards it's very flashy cool makes use of one of the major new mechanics and is more than three times as popular as the deck we last looked at more than ten thousand games so that's the deck that everyone has been jamming the first uh less than a week or so um, I think by now this already has dipped a lot because this was one of the easier to find and build and obvious decks, but it's also not that great in my experience. And since then, I think th um, this number has dipped a lot um, and I'm not seeing it as much anymore. We have seen the scout deck emerge more and more that uh, Patrick Dickman and I have built on the first uh, night, but we'll get into that in a moment. But yeah, the Deep deck still doing okay, like 56.5%, but relative to like what the high, what the like top performing percentages are, this is very like subpar, like it's not a great win percentage, but it's like at least not a terrible deck. Um, this list, however, is very wild and I don't know where it's coming from, um, that it is the most popular list of the archetype. Like if we look at this list, um, it has the same win rate as the archetype and there's almost a thousand games with this specific list. So people must have copied it from somewhere, but yeah, can't say I'm a fan. Um, looking at some of the things, I think Y'all Hunters is really, really good. It's a sport control and it's a two for one. Um, I usually like three of those. Um, then Sep Sprayfin as a one-off makes like no sense at all here. It's really, really random. And this deck is already kind of slow and dirtly and you really don't want to be playing like a 2-2 on turn 4 in this deck. You can't afford to. And only running 2 Devourer of the Depths is just insane to me. The card is nuts. And once you have Deep, it obliterates anything. It can make... It even like gets rid of stuff with like Last Press and stuff like that. It's just a super powerful card and an easy 3 of. Um, Ship Recorder is nice, but it turned out that the, well, the deck already has a lot of top end power and is kind of slow that most people have not run these or not run more than like one of these especially because you can also randomly get them from like your hunters and more often than not it's kind of a win more card which is unfortunate because it's a really cool card and the treasures are really powerful and then we have one terror of the tides which is fine allows you to like close out games quickly once you get to the like a sea monster board situation not sure how I feel about no, Ma uh, no Maokai. Um, I can see not running Maokai, but Maokai is still like a nice um, source to help you get to deep and making saplings is pretty good for board control, but I can see him being a bit too dirty, so I'm uh, open on that. And while I initially didn't like Jettison very much because it's like you're down a card uh, using it, but the deck needs deep so much and so fast um, that and generates so much advantage that throwing up uh, throwing away cards to 
rush to get deep fast um, is worth it. And I think you probably should run three or at the very least two. The third one, I'm not 100% sure, but I think um, you really need to get deep as fast as possible more than anything. And that makes me want to run three jettison, even though um, I initially thought that would be too bad because you lose a, lose out on a card there. And yeah, early game is weak. I think three Vile Feast are a must. Not sure how I feel about Make It Rain. I think Vile Feast is a bit better because it can jump block bigger things as well as kill a small thing. It gains you a health while Make It Rain is only good against small stuff and doesn't help you block early, which the deck needs given that we only have a 1 and a 2 drop. So would run three Vile Feast. Not sure if I like the Make It Rain. I have not been running them in the deck. Um, Riptide, also not a big fan. It's very clunky and if you don't have a Nautilus out, it's pretty underwhelming and if you have Nautilus out it's pretty clunky and uh, will take you till next turn till you can even use it and you have extra Nautilus copies to give you Riptides where you really need them so I'm not a big fan of these either. Uh, I initially ran Salvage but Salvage is just very clunky and as I said the deck is already dirty and coming from behind and you just need to get to um, like deep fast and stabilize the board and as as odd as that sounds, um, what I quickly realized is that Salvage is a bad Jettison, and that Jettison is just so much better. Both get you four cards closer to deep, but this, this costs one, and you usually don't need the cards, and you can't afford the three mob uh, mana, uh, since you might just die before you get all your stuff going. So here's some notes. I might uh, do a deck tag on deep uh, once I have a list I like, but so far I haven't been very happy with the archetype. Deck felt pretty underwhelming and I've been doing a fair share of losing after I initially thought the deck is really powerful and might be kind of broken because the cards seem very pushed, but the deck, um, once you play it more, you really realize how much of an early game weakness and clunkiness the deck has to it. And while the cards individually seem very pushed, the deck as a whole, as it comes together, has some clearing holes that don't seem to be easily fixed, um, especially because the deck needs so many uh, cards by default to like make its engine come uh, together. But yeah, um, these are the top five most played decks of the first week. Now we'll move on to uh, the top, hi uh, top five highest win rate. Um, in fifth place, we have Corinna or Corinna Less Control. Um, depending on the version, people have cut Corinna. This version uh, is what I have currently been messing with, and I think um, a Rioter has shared, which looks really nice and clean. Um, I could totally see getting two Corinnas back in there, but I'm not sure over what, to be honest, um, since um, I think Corinna is less reliable than Ruination, and Vi gives you some punch, so you might need uh, Corinna less. Um, but yeah, basically Vi is a really great addition. It's a very good board control tool and threat. Um, gotcha is a neat upgrade over Get Excited because the deck doesn't have a lot of card advantage. So uh, having to discard cards to gotch, uh, to Get Excited is painful, even though the burn sometimes matters to the face. I think in the end, being able to gotcha for two and not have uh, two for one in yourself by dealing three to something, uh, gotcha probably ekes out uh, Get Excited, but I haven't played the archetype too much to say that for sure. And the rest is all same old, same old. This is still a very powerful strategy that's going to be quite limiting at a top level, which decks will and will not be viable, because if your deck falls apart against this, it's probably not going to be too viable, because this is a very powerful, um, good stuff removal control strategy that uh, can beat other like slow late game decks just by spamming Ledros and against anything else has so much removal at all stages in the game that it's really hard to mount an offense until they are like Vise and Ledros' takeover basically. And sometimes they just randomly kill you with a spider game plan of like Elise into Skidera into Brute Awakening and beat down you uh, and control your board with leveled Elise. Um, so yeah, still a strong win rate here. Not surprised that it's one of the top five decks, especially given that it got some cool new tools. Um, next we have, yep, next we have, um, another old favorite, Bannerman Midrange, this time Mono Demacia, no splash, because we got Unyielding Spirit to replace stuff like Deny and the likes to give the deck some uh, anti-removal, anti-sweeper, and 
late game staying power. Uh, Unyielding Spirit, really nasty card. Unyielding Spirit, especially on a Fiora, is a pain to deal with for a lot of decks. They just kind of lose to Fiora eventually because Fiora killing four guys when she can't die and can't be answered is uh, pretty nasty. I honestly think the card should not be a burst spell. I think the card should probably be a fast spell. So it has the same risk reward kind of situation as Judgment because Judgment is equally game breakingly powerful, but it is a fast spell so the opponent can blow you out. And with Unyielding Spirit, it's similarly powerful, but you cannot blow it out. And there are very, very few cards in the game that can answer it. Riptide with a Nautilus out. Will of Ionia. Speaking of uh, Unyielding Spirit on a champion, because in units there are a couple more options, but not a lot. Um, the Devourer of the Depths, if he is big enough. And Detain. And I think that's it. I might have forgotten something, but I think it's those four. Because Devourer obliterates, which bypasses the can't die kill stuff. Will bounces it to reset it. Um, Nautilus shuffles it in your deck. Uh, Riptide shuffles it in your deck. And Detain removes it temporarily from the game. So, um, yeah. Um, those are my two cents on Unyielding Spirit. Ranger's Resolve, another great new tool here, really, really powerful card, counters a lot of the like damage-based stuff, great combat trick if a lot of units are fighting. Uh, Grizzled Ranger, probably the most powerful and kind of broken card in the new set, um, adding further power to an already powerful deck that has seen nerves. Loyal Badger, um, a great 3-drop here. It is um, close between um, Loyal Badger and Prodigy because the deck is kind of mid rangey and I can see Prodigy still being better. Better is more beatdown, Prodigy is more board control. Um, not entirely sure about that yet. Um, the list that we are looking at is not exactly the most popular list, but the most popular list that I was looking at was basically straight up um, the old um, list with one deny from before the set. And I think that doesn't make any sense because all the good players have moved on to something like this. Um, and it doesn't make sense to show you an old Demacia list because for some reason people didn't even bother to craft like three rares and like two epics to put them in and maybe add a better, add better bear if they like it better. And like the Rangers was off. There are so many powerful new tools and the deck already had this win rate without uh, with, a, with the most popular list, not even playing any of the new cards. And now imagine how this win rate would spike if everyone would be playing the new cards um, that are super powerful, like especially Ranger and Ranger's Resolve are insane, and against certain decks, Unyielding Spirit wins the game on its own. Um, there are also a couple of variations of this, like some people play Vi over Garen, um, then some people lean into some Bilgewater with Misfortune over Fiora and Quinn over Garen, and a little more Scout and a bit lower curve with a bit more one drops for more aggression and stuff like that. There are a lot of directions you can go with Demacia, but one thing is for sure Demacia is uh, getting only more powerful and here to stay. So um, we just need to figure out what the best Demacia version will look like uh, going forward. All right. In uh, third place, we have the burn deck from before, 66.5%. Um, for the overall archetype, looking at this specific list, give me a moment, let me pull it up for you. Um, this specific list, weirdly enough, has even a slightly higher win rate than the overall archetype, which still is uh, very weird to me. Like I said, I make some very good arguments in my uh, deck tech why these cards are uh, not great. And they also are kind of tried and true to be you know, not good in the deck because the burn deck is not new and it kind of started with some jinxes and ravens and people cut them because they were not playing that well in the deck because they are too slow and too clunky and just playing something that guarantees you some damage is gonna be better across the board than just a jinx that the opponent can use a removal spell on and then deals no damage and costs you four mana and stuff like that. That is not what you want to be doing in your burn deck. And I'm pretty sure we will see that direction uh, once other people refine the deck more as well. And we already have seen that, I think, in some of the tournaments. Like, I think the finalist or winning list 
was very close to the list from my deck tech, actually. Um, so yeah, uh, this is um, Burn. Not too surprised to see it in uh, third place for win rate, especially in a Wild uh, West kind of meta game like this when things are all over the place. These decks uh, benefit a lot. Next we have good old Spider Aggro, which is still going strong, 66.8%. Um, I think I said this in the past, not a big fan of Draven Vision. It's cool and it seems like a good fit. And the first person I know that did it was Josh Utterlayton, but he didn't like make it public. He just shared it with me before the uh, AFK Creator Invitational. I tested it as an option for the Invitational and realized the deck just consistently is a couple of damage short and loses out because uh, it doesn't have any way to push through the final damage, which is where cards like Might and Darius come in. And they are, I think, too unique and too important to add a different dimension and angle. Two spiders were... Draven and Vision is just more of the same, and you already have enough of that. Also, there are a bunch of things wrong with this list. It's a bit too clunky. Running two Brothers Bond is just criminal. Um, one Mark of the Isles is really weird. Um, I think you still want like three Mark of the Isles type effects, but you want to upgrade them to Elixir, I think, because the upside of uh, Mark sometimes giving health doesn't matter as much anymore, I think, as Elixir giving plus one more attack. And it's still very good to make all your spiders and small things um, punish a big, a big opponents trying to block for free. Um, I really like three battle casters, so that's great. But I think uh, house spider battle cast release and horror is too much. These horrors should just be another set of one drops to make the deck curve out better. It's after all a very aggressive deck that also wants to play crowd favorite. So I don't get why you would run. 12 2 drops, but only 6 1 drops plus scrolling sensation. That doesn't make any sense. So, a lot to criticize about this list, but the archetype as a whole is really good. There's this new 6 drop that stuns anything um, that is damaged when it, when it attacks. Could be an interesting thing to try over Darius, but might end up having kind of a similar issue um, as other options. And Darius, as a standalone, hard to answer, overwhelm threat that usually deals. Um, very likely guaranteed damage um, to close out games might still be better, but it's something that I'm uh, looking into experimenting with. You can still find um, one of my more recent spiders lists on my mobilitics from the deck tech way back when, where I keep still updating the, the deck um, file on mobilitics to keep the deck more up to date than the deck tech uh, has been since that is from like the early days of uh, open beta. And there we go, best performing deck is Scout. Um, this is leaning heavily into Scout. It's not running Bannerman, it's not running Allegiance. Uh, win rate is almost 68%. This is basically exactly the day one list that Patrick Dickman and I came up with um, the night after the release stream, basically. Set came out, I streamed. After the stream, we got on voice call, uh, looked at the whole set, bounced around some ideas, and this was the first thing we kind of came up with and put together and he tweeted it out and I tweeted it out and streamed it the next day and it took off from there, I think. Um, basically, the list that we posted still had Hired Gun, but uh, we mentioned in the tweet that we weren't sure if Warshaps or Hired Gun is better and it seems the majority uh, wanted to go with the tried and true Warshaps, which is why the most popular list we see here is the list with Warshaps um, rather than Hired Gun. but other than that, it's exactly the list that we uh, shared on the first night. Um, a few changes we considered since then is something like cutting in uh, Genevieve for back to back. Um, we tried cutting the one drops for um, two Rangers resolves and the third Genevieve again to have three Genevieve and uh, two back to back. Um, but that kind of isn't that great because misfortune makes you want to be more aggressive and have a lower curve so now we cut the razor scale hunters to have like two rangers resolve and two back-to-backs and three genevieve and keep the one drops rangers resolve is just too good not to run and it was a mistake to not have any and we corrected that quickly um, but to be fair what we realized by now while this was a really great deck early on um, now the problem is bannerman decks came back 
um, burn decks are popular. So this deck is not good versus burn. It's usually a turn too slow. So burn goes under you. And then decks like Bannerman, other Demacia decks, or like just Misfortune Quinn decks with just a light splash and Bannerman all go over you and outpower you, uh, overpower you and just stop you in your tracks. And so you're basically kind of caught in the middle where you never want to be. You're too slow for burn and you're too small for like other Demacia decks and stuff like that. Um, leaving this specific version in a really bad spot, which is why I haven't done a deck tag on it because I don't think it's actually good anymore. It was really, really good early on. It's super, it's, it just, just was built for like maximizing scout and relentless pursuit and raw power by relentless pursuing on their turn to leveling Quinn or MF over like two turns, just on your turn attack twice, on their turn attack twice, um, and level your champion and then just win the game. Um, so what I would recommend is going closer to something like the Bannerman list, either hybridizing those by like playing the maybe the Misfortune Quinn package and uh, maybe one other um, one other Bilge Water card, maybe even just Jagged Butcher and add in Citria to go like nine one drops and lean into the aggressiveness and also make Bannerman better because if you go like triple one drop into three drop into Bannerman or like one drop into two drop into two drop plus one drop plus Bannerman, it makes really, really good use of uh, Bannerman. And also if you have enough one drops, Relentless Pursuit even with less scout makes a lot of sense. And then uh, you can still stick to like Misfortune Quinn over something like Fiora, um, Garen, Unyielding Spirit type stuff. Um, that's one of the things to try. I'm not sure what is better there, but I'm pretty sure basically if you play Demacia, you have to play Bannerman. Otherwise, you just lose to Demacia decks with Bannerman in the pseudo mirrors. And this deck just doesn't do that and you uh, will just get overpowered. And Garen is also really um, problematic on top of Bannerman and Fiora and Unyielding Spirit. Um, so you quickly just get like... Um, overpowered people just go over the top and that's kind of what happens in these like mid-range aggro uh, mirror type situations one deck goes a little bit bigger a little bit more uh, value and power and then you suddenly just uh, left in the dust and yeah that's what happened to this deck so gotta adjust it if i come up with a version that i still think is good with bannerman uh, that i feel is the way to go with demacia over other options i'll probably put up a deck deck and share it with you but until then um i am exploring other things but yeah um pretty nice to see and a bit proud that patrick and i managed to um come up with the best performing uh week one deck uh, in the first night uh feels really good and yeah the deck was a blast to play and super brutal uh early on but uh, lately when we tried it we just kind of faced the issues that i mentioned consistently and it just felt one step behind what's going on which makes sense because it's a day one deck and things have moved on from there so yeah this was a pretty long one but that's what it normally is like when the metagame is becoming new the the early metagame breakdowns last time around were similar the more familiar we get with the decks and the metagame and so on the shorter these uh, videos will be again but I hope you guys enjoy the deep dive into all the new cards, the versions, and the win percentages and stuff like that. So let me know in the comments down below what you think of the series, of the format of the series. Uh, is there stuff you would like me to add or remove, touch on, um, and so on and so forth. Always happy to hear from you guys and get some feedback to provide you the best possible content that I can. Until then, I'll be back with uh, other content in the meantime and see you next week for the second metagame breakdown of the new set rising tides um yeah don't forget on your way out to hit the like button if you enjoy the content subscribe turn on your notifications for more and check out the nordvp the sweet nordvpn sponsorship deal in the description down below to secure your internet connection and help support the channel um that's it again for this time i'm your host manuels i thank you for watching and i'll see you next time